may I have your attention. I hope you have all had, I hope you've all had a fantastic day so far. I hope the day's been fantastic so far. I want to introduce tonight's dinner speaker, Stephanie DeLuca from Johns Hopkins. She's a professor of sociology. I wanted to have you here today to be part of this group because I think you're going to expand our minds in a really important way, um, especially in behavioral economics. There's, of course, a real benefit to actually understanding the people that we are studying and how they think. And there is no better person to tell us about this than Stephanie DeLuca. Um, she is the author, among, other, among many other things, uh, of one of my favorite books, Coming of Age in the Other America, and also an excellent recent uh, uh, economics paper along with Raj Chetty and Peter Bergman, another uh, group of excellent co-authors on the Moving to Opportunity Experiment. Um, and I'm excited to hear from you. So without further delay, Stephanie DeLuca. Great. And then um, I will stay longer if people want to buy me drinks at the bar because I had to keep turning all this wine down. So that's not a joke. Um. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me get started here. Um, this is a real pleasure, I have to say. I mean, I know Mario Small came last year, um, and a tough act to follow, um, but you know, so you've been exposed to really smart sociologists already. And, um, but it, when I was your age, this kind of a thing wouldn't have happened. To tell somebody you're going to the MBR Behavioral Economics Boot Camp to give a talk um, would have sounded like a joke. <laughs> but it's real, and I'm super excited. Uh, so I'm gonna get into a bunch of things tonight, and um, the first thing I wanna do is uh, thank the families that have spent time with me and my team over the past 20 years. Uh, you're helping me make good on a promise that I make to families uh, when we interview them, which is that if you share your stories with me, I will share them widely. Their voices are, are quiet and mine is loud, and that's not fair. But I'm working with that, right, to, to, do, uh, to do well by them. I hope that I render their stories um, the way that they were told to me. Uh, so these are real families that we've spent time with. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they've shared their uh, small and big triumphs and um, tragedies and been vulnerable. And because of that, we have learned an enormous, you know, enormous amount of things. I also want to thank my team. So I get to do this and come and, and do the dinner, but, um, but this work is very collaborative. And so I've worked with, I mean, I think maybe over 200 students over the past 20 years at least, uh, you know, who have worked, who've helped collect data, analyze data, write papers. And so they're a large team at the Poverty and Equality Research Lab, um, and we've gone all over the country together. We moved places for a while and spent time with people. Uh, and this is our lab now, um, and Nick, Nick Papa George, who some of you might know, um, is my associate director at, at Pearl, as we call it, uh, but this is our team uh, as of fall 2023. So they're part of this. I just didn't want to have you not think that there wasn't a huge team of, of, of my heroes doing this. So we're gonna talk about qualitative work, um, and uh, you know, the, I think that uh, it's, it's promising because there's more uh, momentum around doing it, more interest, but y'all don't really do it that much, do you? I mean, there's an upward trend in the data. Uh, so some folks were really kind enough to go ahead and look at a bunch of journal articles to figure out how many people are using qualitative uh, data, and you guys are kind of on the bottom there. Okay. But, but to be fair, right, um, how many people have ever done qualitative, well, how many of you have ever talked to somebody to make your research better? Ah, so that's interesting. We were having a really interesting conversation about that at the table, right? But then how many people have written it up in a paper? Okay, so, um, so that's good news, bad news, right? All right, but, but all, in all seriousness, why should you do it? Like what is its purpose and what is its promise? Um, Right, so if my in email inbox and Twitter is any guide, uh, economists are becoming more and more interested in doing it. Um, but like regressions, you can do qualitative research really badly. 
Uh, but there's some momentum around including qualitative work, both interview work, ethnography, archival work in um, economic research. George Akerlof says you should probably do it. That's how I interpret uh, his sins of omission paper. There's some movement, um, albeit small, to, to sort of make sure we think about this when doing big data analysis. Robert Moffat has been saying this for a very long time, and so has Larry Katz. So it's not news. Um, and there are some uh, folks who have really come to appreciate this. Uh, but you know, I think it's still early stages, but I think there's a lot of promise in doing this kind of work. But the question, right, is what's the value? And so Sandy Jenks, a sociologist recently retired from Harvard, says, oh, you know, why would you do qualitative work? Well, isn't it better to get interviews and observations of people who are willing to trust you and tell you the truth than it was to get a lot of people who are random sample the population who might lie to you? I mean, that's not a, you know, a bad way to put it, right? Um, so in part of the question lies in what will, how, how do you know they're telling you the truth? Like, how, what are you doing to get better data? But in all seriousness, I think there's some really uh, high level takeaways from the work I've been doing um, for over, over 20 years. So why do qualitative work, but really why do, get, why do you get out in the field? That's the sort of stuff I do. You can do archival work. There's lots of ways to define qualitative work, but why talk to people? and spend time with them when you can't do it with millions of them. Okay, so some of these things will sound familiar to you. Um, so I think that the, one of the most important reasons to do it is to unsettle theoretical, uh, maybe stodgy theoretical and policy assumptions that you get maybe too comfortable with. You all are already used to that because you're behavioral. Um, okay. Uh, and um, to generate better, high, that's supposed to be funny. I mean, I'm still figuring out what behavioral is. That's not stuff we don't. Generate better hypotheses and build better models, really, right? I mean, that's part of the point. Um, you can validate causal relationships, uh, identify causal mechanisms. Right? These are some of the key things I've learned we can do. Maybe less obvious is identify mechanisms that underlie policy take up the less sexy thing that happens when we intervene, right? People are focused on impacts, but take up is really important for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Trying to understand compliance, right? A lot, you know, RCTs are observational studies after a random assignment, so you gotta dig in and understand what's going on with that, you know, and understanding impacts and unintended consequences. You know, what, why did something not work? Why did it work in a different direction? These things are vitally important for policy translation because you can run a lot of RCTs and have impacts, but if you don't know how anything really worked, you can't scale it. You, you can't really tell a, a practitioner how, how to do it. But, but, but albeit crudely, very narrowly, right? So you've got to dig in there. I think one of the other more nuanced things that I, I see the you know, qualitative work having value in is to reveal some co really actually considered choice sets that people really take into consideration. And importantly, th the alternatives that they see to the choices they make, which I think are, you know, maybe right to help explain seemingly irrational choices. Um, but these are often alternatives that are invisible to, let's call them naive researchers, um, but not to the real experts, people living lives are trying to understand. For example, and I'll, if, I'll talk about in a second, I mean, why would you, if you had a housing voucher that paid all your rent, move to a high violence, a high crime neighborhood? Uh, well, I mean, it could be that your clock is about to run out and you're gonna lose your voucher and you can't find a landlord to rent to you, so you take what you can get. Because the alternative is losing that voucher and being homeless and being in a domestic violence situation. Pretty important to know, right? Because the alternative that you know maybe more canonical theory would, would present um, is, is very different from that, right? I think it's interesting because it helps us reveal beliefs uh, about the probability of success uh, to someone's actions or participation in intervention. This is a theme that's starting to really come out of a lot of work. You know, what are the, how do people perceive the payoffs and costs to participation in so, social policy programs or, you know, how, how their own actions? And actually, as we were just talking about, I think you can help specify structural models with qualitative work. Okay, I'm gonna take you through a few examples. Um, it's one thing to say all of that, and it's another to kind of show you what I mean. Um, so I think of these as like policy puzzles, right? And, and, and thinking about sort of how we would improve on the answers to these puzzles with qualitative work. So let, and these are both going to be in domains that are really important for human capital accumulation and social mobility, uh, post-secondary education and where people live, right? So we know these things are related to economic mobility. So they're sort of key domains, and, and they happen to be the domains I study. 
So right, there's a long-standing question around educational equality, which is why we see persistent inequality in educational attainment by race and income. Right, this is stuff you all know. Right, compared to low-income students, this is the uh, HSLS data. Uh, compared to low-income students, right, you have three times as many high-income students enroll in a four-year degree program. Twice as many low-income students at the bottom quartile enroll in two-year schools first um, when compared to the highest income quartile in this data. Uh, we see low-income non-white students delaying college more than uh, more privileged students. We see students undermatching, right? Non-white, first-gen, low-income students are more likely to enroll in low-return sub-baccalaureate programs, some of which we now know are predatory, like for these for-profit schools. Why? Okay, so we spent a lot of time trying to think about this. Uh, you know, I think one of the reasons I like uh, uh, collaborating with economists is because I think a lot about decision making. And sociologists tend to think, as the adage goes, um, you know, economists think about how people make choices and sociologists think about how they don't have any. But I think, right, understanding what gets in the way is as important as what people do in those circumstances. Right? So we have to under understand decision making. It's really vital for a lot of policy uh, uh, take up and um, implementation. So we've been thinking about it a lot um, in, in when it comes to understanding post-secondary uh, trajectories. We've got a lot of different data sets. I won't go into all of them, but the point here is we're not just relying on one qualitative study with one kind of, of student. Um, I have a long-standing study uh, with some colleagues that's uh, all low-income African-American young people who were part of the Moving to Opportunity experiment. Um, and we've done inter we did interviews with them and followed them in various ways for about 10 years. Uh, we have a study, Nick Papa George and I, in a community college in Virginia. We're trying to understand trajectories. Very diverse, more of a median group of students, not really poor, not really advantaged. And we've been interviewing those students to sort of understand why they enroll in certain programs or why they leave a school, go back, go to a different school, and do all of this switching, which seems potentially inefficient. Um, I'm also uh, working with Sue Donarski and team on the Hale um, financial aid experiment in Michigan, trying to understand, despite its success, why it is that not all students who were offered a four-year unconditional tuition and fees paid scholarship would not even apply. Why do students underinvest in education? Now, this is a question your field cares about, right? Okay. All right, so maybe, right, the canonical answer would be, right, they don't like school, they'd have a distaste for school, um, you know, so sort of more sort of old school, but maybe they don't know that um, education pays off, maybe they can't afford it, right? These are sort of things we think about. In the work we've done across all of these samples, um, and I can talk more about how we pull our samples and um, why that's important, uh, maybe in Q&A, um, they're not convenient samples. Uh, but when we talk across these samples that range quite a bit, you know, vastly in terms of students' background, we find that um, uh, money looms large, right? It's this like large sort of screaming alarm clock that students worry about, but it's hardly all that explains the decisions of low-income students. So in the abstract, low-income students understand that college is important, right? Everybody's like, he, you know, heeded the call to try to do college in the United States, right? Um, but not everyone finishes. But in the specific, the application may not make sense. What we have learned is, I think, really, really important that students who are low income or first gen or go to high schools where no one's gone to a really selective college have a really profound fear of failing at it, OK? Uh, college is risky. Social mobility is risky. When it's you climbing the ladder, right, it's kind of scary. And I don't think we value this nearly enough. Young people want to avoid failure and increase success, right? This makes sense. Um, why do they think they're going to fail? So some of what we've learned, right, is they anticipate shocks, negative shocks in their lives that might derail them and they won't finish school. So school's not going to pay off if you don't finish. They feel unprepared and unstable. They worry that the, the education they get um, won't be relevant for a job. It won't be interesting to them. They might get bored. Uh, and they want, don't want to waste time and money because of all of the above. Right? These are really rational things to think about, right? So what do they do to reduce risk and increase payoff, right? There's some interesting strategies. They want to get it right. So what we've been hearing is, you know, I want to wait till I'm stable and I have a job and a place to live before I go to college. I want to know exactly what I want to major in and what my career is going to be before I do it. I want to, um, you know, understand jobs better so I can figure out what to go to college for. And they opt for for-profit trade schools 
um, and this is in the, the Baltimore sample um, in particular, but we're seeing this in, in the other samples as well, um, because these schools are, they're, they're not very long-term, right? The brevity is attractive. Their transparent connection to work is really attractive, um, right? Community college is also attractive because it seems like low-cost exploration if you change your mind, which you feel like you might do. So determination abounds, but so do these low benefit costly strategies. Switching programs, trying to go at more than one certificate. Um, there's an information poverty problem, but you interact that with these strategies, they're actually quite well informed from their, their perspective, and you see some you know, inequality and um, uh, you know, some, some diminished educational attainment. So uh, Nick Papa George, Seth Gershenson, who are economists, uh, and I have a paper at uh, MBER right now. What's that? Yeah. If I have an hour, sure. That's good. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, um, you made a very nice point about kind of how in qualitative interviews, you know, it's kind of much easier to see if someone is kind of lying, you know, you can kind of, they're less likely to do that. Um, but there's another phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is, you know, sometimes people kind of lie to themselves. You know, they do one thing, and then they kind of like try to justify it, and they justify it until they themselves and then they kind of might say it to you and they feel very confident that that's the reason why they did something and you know it wasn't the original reason. Do, do you worry about that and you know do you think some of that is going on with some of the answers you're getting about kind of like the <coughs> like po post hoc behavior? rationalization yeah. for behaviors yeah, that I see yeah so we deal with it a couple different ways, although it's you know always a problem, right? I mean, any data collection with human beings, you have to worry about you know w what's going on with them when they um, you know uh, give you the data. So that's why we have multiple samples of different kinds of students. They all you know many of these students share a low income background, um, but not something, but it ranges. Um, and so when you start to hear things across samples, right? It's sort of in, in across cities, um, it kind of helps. I mean, how many people are you know lying to themselves in the exact same way? Uh, people tell us incredibly unflattering private things. So I think lying on purpose, right, is less maybe the issue than forgetting or some of what you're talking about is absolutely possible. Uh, I think another way to do it is to sort of have more, have prospective studies as people are making decisions. Um, so that's what the longitudinal aspect of some of our work does, is sort of in the mix, right? You're more likely to maybe have, you know, a fresh answer than having time to cook on it. But there's no way to know for sure. Uh, we've done a bunch of different things to try to come at this, but um, but I think it's really important to have systematic samples, have samples that range, um, have different interviewers who might provoke different reactions, right? So you don't have a systematic bias. You might not know what the noise is, but at least it's not systematic, right? So these are some ideas. I'm yeah, happy to. No, that's very nice. Yeah. Just But that depends. But but it, but justifiable to who? You know, to kind of the social group. Right? Who is who? I don't know. Right. So if it's us, then maybe you know, right? I don't know. But if it's folks around them, that's also telling, right? Because you're still grabbing from culture, right? A set of norms and and constituted practices that um, are se they seemingly things that are acceptable to say. Um, it just may seem maybe a little bit more. Um, striking to someone who's different, right, who sees, the, you know, and is in the middle of a PhD in economics, sees the value in doing it. But this, this are, these are really good questions. There's no for sure way to know. Um, and I, we could go on. I, let's talk about it more because there are lots of challenges in doing this work. Um, and uh, the, we'll talk more about it. So in this, this paper, what we're trying to do is uh, use qualitative data to better specify structural model. So I'm not going to get into the structural model. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we were talking about this at the table, you know, it's Robert Moffat observed years ago that structural models are qualitative in nature. They're telling a story about people make decisions. Um, and we can actually do a better job informing those models if we talk to decision makers. It's a really simple idea. So in some of the qualitative work, what I was seeing is that students were, wor were, were being derailed by shocks but they were also anticipating more shocks. And it seemed from what they were telling us that this was you know, entering into their calculation about their post-secondary, um, the, their, the chances of their success in the post-secondary endeavors. So I started working with Nick, and, and, and these are some of my graduate students, 
Because you thought that was really an interesting thing, right? Because if we want to recover the utility cost of school, but we don't take into consideration the risk of non-completion, like can we do it? So what am I talking about in terms of shocks, right? So Sierra is telling a story here, right? Um, she's graduating high school, her mother lost her job, and her sister ended up pregnant. So she began to work in the service industry and um, decided not to go to college. And she says, we had a little downfall. This is, she has had many downfalls. We're at a wait a while to go to school, right? My mother gotten laid off, I had to take care of my family, but we were all looking forward so much to me going to college, is what she's talking about. So I waited and I waited, now I feel as I might be ready. Should I take all year round school or take some classes? You know, I wanna make sure I'm doing it right. Rhiannon is the only student in the 150 uh, young people, young adult sample of uh, 15 to 24 year olds in Baltimore who actually uh, got a bachelor's degree during the, you know, while we observed her, we, we, she um, had finished college. But her brother was murdered when she was in the 11th grade. Um, and so, you know, her mom was really worried about things happening to her. And when Rhiannon, who was a high performer in school and was getting scholarship offers and accepted to multiple four year programs, decided to stay close to home and she went to the, what ended up being kind of the least selective school that she got into because she was worried, right? Mom was worried about me and I was worried something might happen while I was away and I wanted to be able to come back. So I'm gonna put a lot of quotes up here and it's not important to read them all. I've highlighted some language. So this is what I mean by, we start to see this happening over and over again. Right, this worry about what if something happens. Tiffany's worried about running out of money. What if I run out of soap or toothpaste, right? It's stressful, I shouldn't be thinking about this. Like, right, I'm trying to focus on getting good grades. Karen's like, well, what I'm thinking about, right, is you move one step forward and you keep getting knocked back and it's driving me crazy, right? Stuff keeps happening, right? Tyler says, you know, I'm still laying the foundation for my house, figuratively, I don't have time for nobody to come and run over my foundation with a steamroller, because that's how people do, they try to ruin your life. Ain't gonna call it, Matthew says, like I, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to the future, not when anything can happen. So there's this profound worry about things happening in the long run, right? And we can't know for sure that this is a key reason that youth underinvest, but it's certainly an interesting thing that, to think about because it suggests that there are, you know, beliefs about the probability of success should be, you know, they're, they're, they probably matter, right? Because what's the payoff to college if you don't finish? So then we're also hearing about, you know, kind of, well, what do you do then, right, if you're worried about this? Well, then you better get it right. So Haley and Michelle are talking about, I don't want to go to college until I know what I'm doing. This is just select um, quotes from you know, patterns that we've seen in the data. I don't want to go and not have a major because it's a waste of money. Michelle doesn't want to go, right? A two year could lead to four years. Even if I went to a four year, we would kind of get it all done, but I don't want to rush it and end up where I started if I don't know what I'm doing, right? Bart says, I want to go to college, but I need a house. I need money to live, and I can't really start getting a degree until I have a house to live in and steady income. So the thing that middle class kids go to college to get, these kids are trying to get in advance to hedge against failure and holding themselves to, an, to you know, a standard that most of my Hopkins students never do. So then the trade schools become attractive and it becomes obvious they're quick, right? So if you think about a multi-period model, right? If you've got a shorter program, you may be more likely to succeed because if things are gonna derail you, there's a lower probability of that happening in a shorter period of time. So the short programs make sense, and then the, the for-profit schools make it really clear through commercials and aggressive advertising what you'll do with your degree. There's no ambiguity about this. Over and, you know, Crystal says, why would you wait years to become something when you can become something in the course of a year? Ashanti says, it's not like a big commitment like college, right? You can be over and done with it before you know it. That's what I want. These are low return, m many are predatory schools, right? And some research in your field suggests that people are better off not even going at all to these for-profit schools. Okay, so you might say to yourself, well, what if these kids actually had money and we just kind of got rid of that worry? Maybe this is part of what's going on because they're poor. And maybe they're not actually really college material. And there's like an ability thing going on. So this is where the Hale data comes in. It's kind of interesting, right? So the Hale study, how many of you are familiar with Sue Donarski's work in Hale? So this was a really successful RCT in the state of Michigan um, where students who are high performing, low income, uh, seniors are offered a chance to go to Michigan, tuition and fees paid unconditionally for four years. 
without income verification in advance. They've recently published a paper in AER showing these experimental impacts, okay? Hail is a wild success. That's not the issue. What's really interesting to me, right, is the heterogeneity in take up and treatment effects. A third of the treatment group never applied to Michigan. And uh, you know, a fifth of those who got admitted never went. Some didn't go to college at all. Some went to you know, less selective places. I thought that was fascinating. Like, what would you think, right? I can hear a reviewer from one of your journals saying, like, why would you leave $70,000 on the table? You must not like school. You must not, wait, fill in the blank, right? I don't know. Um, what, 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 how would you figure this out? But we, what was interesting is we started hearing some similar things from high-performing students who were also low income. And these were white students in rural areas, not urban areas, so it's a different sample, right? Sky is a, a white student from, from the UP in, in Michigan, says, I've been yelled at not even for applying to Michigan because I had that scholarship, which we did not ask about directly. So if we can talk more about how we ask questions and why what we get is more believable because of the way we ask the questions. Like we never ask our research questions, for example. We can get into that during Q&A or at the bar. Sky says, look, I looked at the University of Michigan and I couldn't find the ag program. That's all I wanted to do is get you know, a good ag program. Um, he ended up at a community college to study crop management. Why would I spend four years doing something and getting a degree I don't care about? Right, so Dylan says, I'm gonna take a gap year, right? I'm gonna settle on like whether I'm gonna like go with the job I've got, you know, I don't think I need higher ed because it's trades and they're never gonna not be needed. Well, actually, guess what, uh, Dylan, you're right. Maybe more than, you know, in several decades. But would Dylan and Sky be better off going to the University of Michigan, right? Okay, gotta think about that. Elizabeth says something really interesting, right? I, I'm thinking long term, right? Which way would college benefit me? These are high school seniors, but right? they're really thoughtful. Right now, I want to be honest, even if I could afford to go to college, she's in the control group, I wouldn't at this point in my life. I'm not ready. Maybe I'll be a better student and able to work through that a bit better later on, because I don't think I'm in a place to efficiently get my degree. So she decides to uh, study welding in the military. These are students whose SAT scores could have likely gotten them into selective schools, okay? All right, so you see the point, we're learning really interesting things that would tell us about policies that may or may not work, why some policies do or don't work. You can think why financial aid doesn't solve all of the problems, right? And it may very well be that it's not that these students are making mistakes, um, it's just that we don't have the kind of information that we need to run the models that would help predict their behavior. Okay, another puzzle, neighborhood quality, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, so one of the other reasons I just didn't mention, so that the HALE works preliminary, right, but we've been really kind of digging into this. We're doing some follow-up interviews in the spring um, to see how, how, what, how students feel about their paths and their choices after actually like doing them. So um, I'm really excited about that. But so some of this is about fitting in, right, because you might fail because you don't fit in and you're not going to be happy. Um, and that's actually not necessarily like just you know something low-income students might worry about, but the margin for I mean the cost of failing, right? The worry about failing, right? What's your safety net, right? It's it's more costly and in, in, in maybe in your mind than it's just a matter of which which uh, selective college you go to that fits your identity better than others, right? These kids are really worried about about just fail, failing uh, in a bigger sense. So uh, you know religion, politics, sexual um, preferences, and you know, the gender identity came up a bit because we were in some, some uh, towns that are quite conservative. Um, this, the cultural turn, I quote, against higher education is really interesting to me. I'm reading Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, and I highly recommend it if you would like to be fully disquieted about um, the way you think about economic mobility. But let's talk more about that because it's, it's interesting. Um, I think it's probably, there's, there's, a, there's a range. It's quite bimodal. Many, many kids' parents are really proud of them, right? That they, it, so I, I think it, it, we're in a, an interesting time. Um, but what, what, what young people are seeing is like what's going on around them. Like people are not finishing college because most people don't in their income bracket, right? They're struggling to get jobs. They see trade schools, maybe people finish them. You, you know, well, I think if, I, if, if doing a trade school means you need to know what you're gonna do, I should have my college major read. They're applying the schema of one kind of institution to another where it doesn't fit, where you don't have to pick your major. 
You don't even have to have one sometimes, right? It depends where you go. So but anyway, we can, we can get into that a bit more, but it's a really interesting question now. And the question of the, this sort of universal prescription for college, like we do the transition to adulthood really badly in the United States, right? Launching you know, young people to work, whether it's after a four-year degree, because they, after they dropped out of a four-year degree, after we, we don't do this well. Um, and I think, you know, so what do we do when people enter the labor market soon they think they're going to? Uh, we don't handle that very well. So this anxiety that students are feeling, I think, is, is well justified because the, the policies to support them to do anything but this are scarce. Okay, so another puzzle, right, as I hinted at earlier, right, is, you know, why would parents, um, you know, live in neighborhoods that are high violence and, you know, um, uh, high poverty, okay? Uh, we know neighborhood uh, and school quality, which is often tied to neighborhood, really impact life outcomes. Um, you know, there's now 30 years of interdisciplinary evidence to, to, to show neighborhoods matter. Uh, poor people tend to move more than more affluent people. And but shorter distance moves, but, but why do they gain so little, say this is one way to ask the question, from each residential move? But the, it's even more interesting when you think about choice policies or getting a subsidy that pays nearly all of your rent and relaxes the financial constraints altogether. And we see still in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, the largest program we have to subsidize housing for poor people in the US, um, we see that like the majority of, of voucher holders live in moderate to high poverty neighborhoods. You know, what's going on with that? So I spent a lot of time in a bunch of cities with my students trying to understand how people end up living where they do. I got really interested in selection processes because when I was coming up in grad school, all we wanted to do was like, you know, get rid of selection bias. It turns out the selection itself is something you really need to understand in order to understand po policy effects, right? I mean, why is it that, you know, many of the families in the moving to opportunity experiment didn't move to low poverty neighborhoods? Um, to figure that out required understanding how poor people ended up living where they do. I, wa I wanted to understand how they made decisions about where to live. Lots of work over lots of years. We've been everywhere from Alabama to Seattle. Um, we've done some income diverse samples of how parents make decisions about where to send their kids to school and live. So we're drawing on lots and lots of data here and I'm sort of pulling um, uh, the you know, in in empirically defensible patterns from that work. I can talk more about how we do that. But, you know, when I was coming into this, I was really interested, you know, how is it that you don't end up in the best possible neighborhood when you've got a voucher that pays your rent? So the classic model of residential mobility, right, some of this is in, you know, housing economics, some of this is in geography, right, is, is you know, a deliberate, sequential, uh, rational model, right, where you, there's pull factors, right, you want to move somewhere more attractive, you, your family's growing, right, so parents search, they search for a while, they try to maximize the bundle of you know, housing amenities, neighborhood quality in school, all this kind of stuff, right? End up in the best neighborhood you can afford maximizing the bundle. Okay, that's not how poor people make decisions about where to live. This is clear as a day from our, our research in five cities. This is what it looks like when poor folks make moves, okay? And this is, um, th we found even in our Ecom Diverse sample in Cleveland and Dallas three times the number of high income families were making pull moves than push moves, um, right? So there's a lot of what I call reactive moving going on. The decision's not happening at all, it's being forced on you. So m decisions to move and decisions of where to move are nearly on top of each other instead of sequential because there are all kinds of factors happening outside of families' control that push them like pinballs in and out of housing units. Um, eviction is but one of them, and it's not actually the most common. There are lots of other sources of housing instability. Uh, gentrification, also not one of them. Poverty is far more destabilizing than gentrification is. So when you, you, you end up having to move because your housing unit fails, um, you're in a domestic violence situation, someone is shot on your doorstep, the house is mold or vermin infested, all of these things are things that we saw quite a bit of. What do you do? But you gotta find a place to live. So, you know, some shortcuts are used. Interesting ones, like not looking at the map of the metro area and trying to decide where to live, but, the, but as soon as you see anything for rent, you take a look, okay? Um, looking for places that don't require a security deposit or credit check. Guess where those neighborhoods are, right? But, but, but what you'll do is you will get housed, and the alternative to doing that is being homeless. So you take what you can get, right? You don't optimize, right? You settle and you survive. Um, what also tends to happen is schooling and housing decisions are decoupled. Housing, to, you know, is paramount to achieve uh, and secure. School, we, we, we heard from parents over and over, you know, something that came later. 
which is not what happened with our low or high income, especially our white, our white families uh, in, in Dallas and Cleveland. Um, so I'll show you a couple of uh, uh, some data from the, these studies. I won't get all in the Stan, Stan's quote. The point of Stan's quote is that it's long because when I interviewed Stan, um, an affluent white guy in his kitchen with his wife, and I said, Stan, like, tell me about how you guys ended up living here. So that's how we ask questions, right? We don't ask why. We say, tell me how. Tell me more, okay? Like, tell me the story, right? Tell me the whole story. And he's got this detail, right? Like, of like best, okay, school, he's doing the thing, right? He's trying to like maximize on all of these different parts of the bundle, the per square foot, um, you know, price that versus the school district or a bigger house, right? He's doing the thing that like the classic model suggests you do. I have never heard of this from any poor family or even moderately poor family I've ever interviewed, right? This really detailed, calculated kind of thing and not even all of the high, high um, income families do. Like Catherine says, you know, it's resale value. Okay, it's maybe not like as deliberate as Stan, but it's deliberate and thoughtful. So when we talk to low income families, you know, um, Josephine said to me, oh, how did I end up on Smith Avenue? Well, my house caught on fire at the last place. What, what I went out to see in Alabama was how people decided where to live, and what I learned is what bumped them out of their last house. So it was a real wake up call to me. Um, she says, you know, I had a date with somebody, and then we were going to the corner store. I saw somebody fixing a house, and so I, you know, rented that house. And I said, was the only unit you looked at? And she says, oh, yeah, I was just ready to live somewhere else because she was living doubled up in an overcrowded situation, not an other all good alternative. Denise said, this, that was an emergency move, right? My ceiling caved in. Uh, Annalise, a, a white mom in Cleveland, said, you know, um, her situation was pretty rough um, uh, with one of her kids' fathers, and she said, look, I didn't have time to wait for something better, right? The place was secluded off the street, and that to her was a signal that it was probably okay because the block face and housing unit become the units of selection, not the neighborhood, when you're trying to move quickly and reducing risk for your kids. Okay, so this is what moving looked like. It looked difficult, um, you know, for, for poor families to do with in with voucher holders. Some of this was the, was it the same? The, the voucher holder, the vouchers uh, run out of time, and then you have to find somewhere to live. So, I ended up collaborating with some additional economists that um, work up the street: uh, Raj uh, Chetty, Nathan Hendry, Larry Katz, and then Peter Bergman and Chris Palmer as well who were looking at, a subset of them were looking at tax data, trying to understand moving and the you know, MTO experiment. You might be familiar with some of this work. And so um, some housing authorities were interested in their research, which 30 years of sociology had already suggested neighborhoods are probably important, but like when a bunch of you guys say it, it's really true, right? <laughs> but I see it as like cumulative science. Um, so housing authorities were going, oh my gosh, you know, I wanna do a better job for my, my, my customers, my families, like, how do we do it? And had reached out to them, and then they convened a group of, of housing authorities to figure out how do we actually start testing some of our ideas about how we could do a better job uh, do, at, the, at this. Um, so we have a mixed methods paper that's coming out in AER. Um, Larry, Sarah, and I have a paper that has just came out in the Russell Sage uh, Journal of Social Sciences where we use mixed methods data to try to understand really, you know, what if we got rid of a lot of the barriers and um, uncertainty that, that families I've been talking to for a long time have been experiencing and could do a better job. You know, right, I mean, when we were thinking about like why is it that families don't move to opportunity, I mean, I had a lot of ideas why. Um, you know, the economists on the team sort of were trying to suss out different explanations, right? Um, is it preferences, um, resources? Well, the voucher takes care of that. Um, but if it's barriers, not preferences, you know, how do we reduce these things, right? So part of this was us converging together and trying to figure out how to answer that question, which in your field was a new question, but in mine was a question that we had long ago resolved. Um, so there's, I don't know how many of you got a chance to read the paper. Okay, you don't, you don't want to raise your hand because then it's going to be obvious if you did not. Okay, fine. Um, but I, know I, can't, I don't have time to go into detail on a lot of the, the study. Um, but this, uh, the qualitative work in this project allowed us not just to sort of answer a puzzle about segregation and suboptimal housing decisions, but figure out how, um, why a policy that worked, worked. So we ended up doing a multi-phase um, RCT in, with multiple waves of qualitative work and ethnographic observations um, with this intervention that our partners in the Seattle and King County Housing Authorities designed and invited us in to work with them, which is really important. And the experiment, which was removing barriers and increasing resources to help families have more choice and 
you know, move to high opportunity neighborhoods, right? It was wildly successful. There's a 38 percentage point difference in the proportion of families in the treatment group who moved to high opportunity neighborhoods when compared to the control group, right? Pretty big. Okay, so why did it work? Was it, you know, families getting information? Was it the fact that you got the 3,500 extra dollars if you moved to high opportunity neighborhoods, right? Was it financial incentives? No. So that's actually, I can just tell you right now, that was not the, th the, the primary driver uh, of the experiment. We had to convince the reviewers of this um, and for, uh, you know, over the course of several revisions. But it's interesting, right, because part of the story of figuring this puzzle out involved multiple methods. So preferences, you know, I mean, sure, maybe, but 72% of the families in this experiment had expressed interest at baseline in moving to high opportunity neighborhoods. Like, they were game already, right? Um, and we heard evidence of them knowing about these neighborhoods in the qualitative work. So what happened is the intervention actually ended up having staff who customized the program resources. It wasn't what families got, it was how it was delivered. And the, the communication um, support and uh, and customized approach that, that the staff who administered the intervention um, uh, implemented that really made, made a big difference. Um, you know, high level, we, we um, and I can talk more about this, right? We tried to take the literature and previous, you know, research on housing policy and, and work with the housing authorities to design an intervention that should get rid of most of these barriers. And it worked, and the question was kind of like, what of this mattered the most, right? So that's what we were trying to think about, right? Search assistance, helping negotiate with landlords, which I didn't mention yet, but is like a really big piece of why it's hard for people to find housing, not so much even uh, because landlords, uh, you know, discriminate by race, but increasingly they discriminate by income and credit scores, and and um, and families don't even bother trying to call landlords when they have vouchers in high opportunity neighborhoods because they're afraid they'll get rejected and then they'll waste time and the voucher will run out. Right? These were things we were learning. So again, these were the experimental impacts of phase one, right? This big difference in the historical mean rate of vouchers in these jurisdictions, voucher holders moving to high opportunity neighborhoods, right, quite low. So we're like, what's the, you know, so what's the secret sauce, as Larry um, called it. So what was, how do we figure out the secret sauce underneath this intervention? So we, digging into these interviews, and, and it's interesting because in the pi I didn't think I had a lot to learn about housing mobility programs because I've been studying several of them for 20 years. And I thought for sure this one wouldn't work that well because families didn't have to move. Everybody got a voucher in the treatment and control group and I'd studied programs like MTO and a, another program in Baltimore where you had to move to a specific neighborhood you couldn't use your voucher. So I was surprised too. We started doing the pilot interviews. We open up and say, and I'm like running low on time here but I'll be done in, in a few minutes. Tell me about CMTO. We actually don't start though. We start with tell me the story of your life. I can talk about why that's important. Um, but eventually say, okay, you know, Let's talk about the program. Tell me about CMTO. And that's how we start. And so what comes out when you ask an open-ended question like that is really interesting, right? Because if you ask, let's talk about whether you think it was the financial resources over the you know, maps you got, like no, right? I mean, that's kind of weird. And you don't, you know, it's not, it's not conducive to really learning about process. Um, and you're gonna get yes, no answers. And those are bad. Um, for unless they're clarification questions for what we're trying to do. So we heard a lot of um, just this, you know, discussion of how supportive and, um, uh, you know, how much the navigators that families met through this program made a difference to them. This really strong emotional language, right? Jackie, this uh, white mom who moved to Isikaho, I interviewed, said, you know, it was like a light bulb went on inside of me, this whole flood of relief, because I didn't know where to move. I didn't know how to use my voucher. It's not working. And it was the supportive nature of having conversations as the navigator that really mattered. Melinda said, you know, yeah, I mean, so when I got the, the voucher, when I ended up in the program, I, it wasn't just for them to pay your rent. It made me cry because it was also to help your kid grow up in an area and be successful. And it made me happy to think that that's what was going to happen. Families, the, the research pitch around neighborhoods and opportunity neighbors as being a motivation for the study, which they got at um, random assignment, was resonated so, to such a degree that they talked about it when we asked them and said, let's talk about the first time you met with someone. They remembered the research, right? I always thought that was interesting. 
So part of it too was just streamlining and, and you know reducing bandwidth tax. Like Lisa says, you know, part of I mean the program, right, right, it was me staring at the phone, you know, trying to search online for houses while my son's playing around, right? And the less I have to do that, the better. So, you know, it's like, you know, I'm not focusing on him. So that the getting referrals for places to live and having some help finding listings was really helpful for me. Um, and we heard this sort of streamlining um, in different ways from lots of, of parents because between the paperwork the referrals, the applications, right? There's a lot of stuff that's taxing and administratively burdensome, uh, and the navigators helped with that as well. Brokering with landlords I could talk about for a long time, but being rejected by landlords is a demoralizing experience that some of the families refer to as feeling like you didn't get the job. It's embarrassing, and you wanna like not experience that, so you don't go to places you think it's going to happen, right? And so here, families had to really kind of get over the residential pessimism they had about being rejected and hold on for a second and believe things could be different than they were before. They had to have their beliefs about the probability of success increased, which is I think a really fundamental thing that happened with these navigators, okay? The financial assistance helped, but it helped because navigators deployed it in these really important points of the process. It wasn't just that families got you know $3,500, they had somebody to help them figure out how to use that money for their situation, how to get a landlord who sees an eviction on someone's record agree to rent to that person because of an increased security deposit and mom writing a, a, a small note about what it is that led to her having the eviction and what she's doing now with her family. Um, so I'm gonna just skip ahead here, but I think part of what, you know, a, a sort of, these are kind of really clear mechanisms, but overall there was this really kind of profound psychological and emotional uh, experience that we heard about from families. And we're talking like 60 plus percent of families reported some sort of um, you know, emotional uh, support or communication aspect of the program that really was, was helpful for them. Confidence, boosting my confidence, gave me more confidence to think that I could actually get a place to live. If you think something's not gonna happen, it's not gonna pay off, why are you gonna do it? You're gonna, what you're gonna do instead is avoid the worst case alternative, which we often don't know what it is, right? But that's another theme that's been really popping out here. Right, Odyssey says it was helpful, right? Because they make you comfortable with doing something new, but then they give you a roadmap to how and why it can't fail. These searches took sometimes three or four months, and families were like, I'm ready to take anything, I'm ready to settle. And it slowed down their thinking about what it is they really wanted out of their, their housing in their neighborhood. So I think there's a, a bunch of things that uh, you know, were, were underneath the experimental results. And the reason it was important to dive deep like this was because you can't always afford the whole package, right? And if you wanna scale up, how are you going to do it if you don't know for sure which pieces were really the most important? You know, because right, it's a cost effectiveness and efficiency question. Another interesting thing, right, is working with the navigators help families frame failure, getting denied for a place is normal part of the housing search process, and to just keep going. And they would text message that back when people reached out to them. We also had another experiment that happened to show that the qualitative research in phase one was right by splitting out the buckets of the intervention to show that the full Monty bucket with, with the high touch navigators was far more effective in increasing opportunity moves then a light, lighter touch, cost optimized, um, maybe one meeting with the navigators, reduced financial assistance bucket, just a financial assistance bucket in a control group. So it was a really interesting kind of multi-method study that really showed us what was important. And guess what, people matter. It turns out this is probably true for lots more social policy domains that we're starting to learn about, right? In education, sectoral workforce programs, People matter and support might matter. It might be a very key social policy ingredient and it would be great to know that and find out that we could save money and help people if we treat them well in our social policies. These are the women that made it happen. It also helped when Congress decided to propose legislation to scale up creating moves to opportunity that they included in the proposal to, to, in the bill to have a customized approach to uh, successful transition opportunity areas coming out of the mixed methods work. That's how we knew customization and this sort of personal approach was important. Okay, I, there's a lot of challenges here. I'm gonna like open it up for questions now. Um, doing this work is hard. I mean, doing all of the work we do is hard and costly and you have to um, hire, train, supervise and mentor all of the people who help you do this, um, right? There are ways that I think qualitative research can go awry 
um, right? I mean, there's, I think, a, a real issue um, that some of us are starting to, to contend with, which is um, transparency and reproducibility isn't something that, you know, happens with qualitative research. Like we, you know, turning your data and code over to the journal and economics, we don't do that in sociology. And in fact, a lot of qualitative work, um, I looked at the last five years of the top five journals in sociology and could find um, maybe 18%, 18 to 20% had a sampling uh, approach that was transparent. Um, like just, you know, and very little was systematic. So who's in your study? It's not clear. Do you always need to have that? Not necessarily. But the bigger issue is if someone wanted to reproduce your study, they couldn't. And most qualitative folks do this by themselves. And there's lots of reasons for that. Right? You need a lot of money to like have big teams. But if you're the only person who conceives of, executes, and writes about d data, I mean, maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe you start to believe things um, that you want to believe. I have students who don't even know what I'm trying to get them to code data for, and I don't even talk to them for weeks. I mean, we have a whole approach at the lab. Um, you know, we have lots of folks interviewing people. We have separate people doing the coding. We have a whole bunch of things, right, because I want, most importantly, you know, to be, I want to know that I'm wrong if I'm wrong, right? So there's a collaborative approach here. So um, there's lots of, of different things that come with this work. They're challenging, and I don't know that we've got it all figured out. Um, you know, but definitely I think, and I'll leave you with this, um, one of the most important things about doing this work is the fact that it can disquiet you, right, um, and, and help you think through assumptions for models that aren't going to fit and help you uh, figure out what you're doing with this data. But I like this quote in particular, right? If we're trying to understand behavior, we want data, we want fresh statistical data, factual studies, that are the you know, healthy element of disturbance that constantly threatens and disquiets the theorist, prevents him from coming to rest on some inherited obsolete set of assumptions. Who said this? The first editor of Econometrica in 1933. I'll stop there.
But in my studies, they are. Actually, that's one of the differences. Um, so they we, so they can opt out, but almost nobody does. So what we do, what we did with the community college study is we took the administrative data for a year and did a stratified random sample of students and got 80% of them. And then looked at the 20% we didn't get. I mean, this is something that is not done typically. Because in what I, we're starting to look at now is, you know, what, so what is that by us, right? Because the last 10% are really hard to get, but for reasons that could be quite diff bimodal. Um, but, but really making sure you get the folks who didn't opt in and take the flyer off the cork board is important. Because you may not know, right, what it is that you don't know about them, but you're, you didn't get the first people, right? And so I think that's a key thing that's costly. Um, you know, I mean, sure, you're going to get, I mean, there are a lot of what, you, I mean, we can talk a lot about the interesting things that you said, but I think that's one thing that's a real, a thing that I really um, focus on because, uh, you know, it, it's easy to do convenient samples, but showing up at people's houses over and over again, randomly varying the hours, like stakeouts, when people show up and they've got groceries and you help them carry them into the house, and you've been trying for three months to get that mom, and now you're in her house, and great. So this is what we do. And it, it, we don't even talk about it nearly enough um, because I, I really think it's so important. Whether right? you want to do a study of you know how important counselors are for students who are thinking about you dropping into college, and then you go hang a flyer in the counseling office. Well, what's the problem, right? Why not take a sample of students in the college, try to get you know, and then say, well, the twenty percent we didn't get, like who are they? Okay, what if we? I mean, we've done a bunch of different things. We've done near, literal ne nearest neighbor matching with people we couldn't get because we're not in the field forever. Randomly selecting right, left, back, behind for the house that we couldn't get. We've done really like interesting things because I think that is so important because the who you didn't talk to is is almost never discussed in my field and if I mean this is science I mean you can't decide that some of this stuff doesn't apply just because the works qualitative but anyway I, it's a big um, you know uh, uh, it's one of my big sticking points in my in the field so anyway I it, I just wanted to clarify it's one of the things we do that makes the work so difficult um, and the reasons people don't call you or get back to you right away, um, you know, varies a lot. Um, and, and anyway, so uh, I think, and who, who responds, the least, it's, it's, it's interesting. And so we're trying to actually figure out what we get from the last 10% um, in some really interesting ways across studies to see if we can make the case for my field that this is actually something we should do. But, um, uh, but yeah, and I, I, the point about the, like we were just talking about this, right, Hunt, the little qualitative work or the little exploratory work, I, I think that's right. Many, why do we do this, right? We're curious. And the instinct that you might not have a right is exactly why you do it. And I don't know that, I mean, we don't write up everything either. <clears throat> but what I think is, um, you know, what's interesting is the resistance to you to, to talk about it in papers. I mean, obviously there's length and all this sort of stuff, but there's, you know, maybe not being able to do it full scale. I think that's what collaborations are for because, you know, I, again, like try as I may, um, I don't want to run these structural models, you know, and try as, I mean, I can't, you know, I'm not going to run the tax data, right? I don't have access to the internal. I mean, there are things I'm not going to do, um, but being able to have that overlap and push back against things and have fresh eyes, I think is really valuable, even if some of it doesn't make it into the paper. Um, you know, anyway, I, but I think, right, it was, you know, there was a Twitter exchange recently about AI, I don't want to get into it, um, but that where people were like, oh, we, we economists are doing qualitative research all the time, and then someone says, why isn't it in the paper? And I think I know why, but, I mean, 
we could start sharing more of that because I think it, it's a culture thing. I could go, I mean, I don't know, but you're right. I know that you guys have metrics and certain things count such that the, you know, the econ grad students that work on the teams, like we have to make sure they have a JMP. Is this gonna be a JMP? Like, or is it worth it to keep going, right? These are real concerns I, I appreciate. Yeah, Hunt. Yeah, well, the second thing I, I can't I can't help you with because um, we you know we all suffer from from this. Um, although I started working on this talk three weeks ago and still didn't feel like right. I mean, she you know we, we we try and the older we get, the more we try to work in advance and we have more stuff to do, so it still doesn't work. So I think like in the first point, so th so there's some range around this, right? So some of them, there, you know, there's sort of a range of of how sudden the moves are. So right, I use some examples that were more you know um, on the really reactive part because it's clearer. <clears throat> and some are a little bit murkier. You know, just outright planned deliberate moves are very rare uh, among low income and even sort of more moderate income um, families. So I think that, um, you know, there, there's some range around that. I, I think part of this is just that, you know, you're, you're alluding to some of this band, the bandwidth issue, right? I mean, sort of going, okay, well, maybe it'll get better tomorrow. I mean, we hear this too, right? Like I've got three, you know, this, I've got three jobs. Like I don't, you know, I'm looking, maybe I'll wait to, you know, get the voucher or this or that'll happen, right? There's some ideas about things that could be more optimal. And, you know, until things reach this boiling point, I mean, there, there is some of that going. I mean, but I, you know, I think um, then you go, okay, well, what would it take to get the housing unit before you absolutely have to? It, it's hard. Um, so I think it may be with other kinds of decisions, it may be a little bit different. Um, but housing searches are hard, and, and the ho housing is just so expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, we heard, I mean, just people, t you know, taking, you know, the, the finishing the graveyard shift, taking their kids and getting a hotel in some of the suburbs of, of Seattle to try to, like, find a place. Um, you know, and what, you know, I kind of want to do, I, I don't know. I'm not really answering the question, but I mean, I think part of it is people aren't, aren't like, not aware that they're in a bad situation, right? And I don't think that's what you're implying, but it's, Right, it's always that, and I'm sure you have formal ways of describing it, right, just that there are so many things going on in any given day that if it's not as bad as it could be, then you're gonna hold out, right, a little bit longer to take care of the tyranny of the urgent like we always do. So I, I don't know. Um, and uh, it's, it's a bit, it's, it's, there's always, I think, and this is part of the importance around sample selection because there's a range for some of this. It's not everybody's, you know, um, you know, uh, ceiling caved in, but in Alabama, it was it was incredible how poor the housing quality was. Um, but you know, so there is some some range there. But but I think, in in housing is is one of these things where the anticipation anticipation of the difficult search and the rejection and the wasted time is probably part of it. I think, um, yeah. I, I, and then you know, I mean, I, I I think a lot about this with the the college planning as well. Um, you know, part of it is could we could get students to think about their careers sooner, it seems like. But then there's this always this other question where, you know, well, why, why do we want to funnel low-income students into trades? Do we want to do that? And that's a difficult, a separate question. But we could be doing, like they're experimenting in trade schools, community colleges, they're swirling, they're, you know, we're looking at how long it's taking people to get an associate's degree, do they get it? Like, well, and they're telling us, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, right? I mean, there's some of that kind of, um, you know, uh, learning going on, but we could do this in, in a less costly way sooner, but we don't anymore, because we used to call that vocational education, it, came out of fa it went out of fashion, right, in favor of college for all. So, I mean, I think that's an area where we're starting to reckon with this. 
um, and with this backlash that um, you know that y you mentioned earlier, I think, and you know, some of the demands in some of these labor market areas. I mean, they're you know they're you know in, in um, uh, um, Newport News. There's a welding company that can find anyone to hire, so they built a welding college on. You know, I mean, this is stuff that it tends to be these little tiny stories, right? And we're just screaming about four-year degrees. But we've got to think bigger than that. And if we're going to think bigger than that, we have to start thinking about work earlier. And the fact that what you do, you may change, you, you know, we think of education as a one and done thing and, like, and that doesn't, it doesn't work like that either. Um, so we have a lot of just these, these, you know, this sort of college for all prescription and everyone's like, I'm going to try to do it. And then they're doing it in their way and it's not working out so well. But, you know, one, one student said to me, I, well, I wanted to be a phlebotomist, but then I realized like I couldn't stay on the side of blood once I started the program. We could have fixed that. Um, even, you know, if the student didn't think to plan, right? And we, there are some countywide seat career and technical education centers. We don't study them. That literature is like a backwater. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. So the education stuff's a, a, another space where we could think more about this. And we don't because we're fixing, if I'm reading the Sandel book, we're really fixated on um, rising and the dignity of work take us a back seat, right? Yeah. So yeah, like we don't do that. Yeah, so what I try to do is get really smart people on my team. Everyone is um, a bad and good interviewer in, inside, right? The most social people are, can, can be terrible interviewers because they do the thing where they share back and we're like, we don't want that. <laughs> <clears throat> and and the, you know, students were, you know, I, I would have other grad students be like, well, I'm not sure if like Peter's gonna work out because Peter's sort of, Peter's like a king interviewer because his awkward laugh and quiet nature forced people to stay more, you know? <laughs> and he had this really awkward little like giggle. I won't, I won't do it for you, but, um, and it just worked like a charm. So you never know, first of all, like, right, are people gonna be good or bad at this? Um, you know, I mean, part of it is that there's an empathy thing here that, you know, we, so I have students that's practice in their daily lives. If, you know, your, you know, your partner says, oh, you know, um, you say, you say well, how was your day? And says, I don't know, he's like, fine. What do we normally do in a situation like that? We might say like, oh, okay. Say, tell me more about that. Never happens. So I have students practice that too. So that's like the training of just the general skills. And then my husband's on to me, like big time now. So he knows what I'm doing when I'm doing it. Um, but, uh, but it changes everything. And actually, I could say a lot about the interview itself and that, that experience and what is it. Um, so ethnography and interviewing are like not the same thing, but there's elements of both in both, and that's a whole separate thing I thought about talking about. Um, and there are people who call themselves ethnographers, and they wouldn't think I am. And you know, it, it's a, a false dichotomy. The attitude, behavior, and consistency issue is a big one. Um, if you're trying to understand the prevalence of like a behavior, I w maybe interviewing wouldn't be the way to do it, um, right? And but if you're you know you're trying to understand some some other, like, like this question of like, what are the alternative people see to, the, to different courses of action? Um, maybe, you know, that's helpful, I, I don't know. But uh, in terms of matching, so um, I get asked this a lot because unsurprisingly our team is mostly white, although, you know, um, Hopkins is now the third most diverse undergrad student body in the country. Um, thank you, Michael Bloomberg, for helping with that, and, and Ron Daniels, our president, for really pushing this. So increasingly, we're getting really, you know, teams of, diverse in a lot of ways, you know, different experiences. But the matching can sometimes backfire, right? Because the whole point is that you switch the script, right? The sort of typical power dynamic when an educated, you know, sort of higher class person asks a person in a, you know, a lower income bracket, you know, tell me about your behavior, right? That power dynamic, you flip that script and you're the student of somebody else's life and they're the expert. That move is game changing. It doesn't matter who you are. Once people get that, it, it, it changes the way the conversation, so the, the, the beginning of the interviews, you know I'm saying, tell me the story of your life. Because first of all, they're like, is this a social worker? Is this someone from the housing authority? She says she's not. Is this like a teacher? You know, is this whatever? A at a certain point, you know, you're on the floor playing with the pit bull, and no one's gonna do that. Nobody's gonna ask you about your life and then really sit there and really 
have nowhere better to be, right? Okay, so there's like a lot. But the matching thing is so interesting because I really think that this, we were talking about this, the outsider perspective, right? That space allows for teaching and, the con and, and to confer expertise on people who are never given expertise. Now, it, maybe that means people say, so. I, it, you have to do it to feel it. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I've been doing this for a long time. I mean, are people feeling forced? Over, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, um, you know, but there's a point at which they're like, okay, she's not kidding. Like, this, I'm gonna just say the things and nothing's a wrong answer. And we don't ask why, never ask why. I have tried and failed for years to, you know, prove this point wrong that you can ask why in a non-judgmental way. Why are you, you know, studying behavioral economics? Instead of saying, tell me the story about how you ended up studying behavioral economics. Start at the beginning. And then I just, I just shut up, which is a creepy thing. My students aren't ready for that. Shut up. Okay, so that's different, right? So part of it too is if, if and again, I can never, you'd never be sure that someone's not trying to say the right thing, but the removing the why when it's the thing you want to know the most about is actually really important. Tell me. Give me an example. Take me back. Say more. This, instead of saying, you know, why did you have a baby and not marry, the, <laughs> marry that, your boyfriend? Um, you know, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, and, and it, it, so again, there's no, there's, there's no way of knowing, um, but you know, uh, does everybody mean the same thing in a forced choice survey response? I don't know, we could worry about this for, a, you know, I mean, a lot, so I, I don't know, but that's one way we, we sort of try to remove that pressure. Um, and uh, the matching, I think, you can't really do it, and sometimes, you know, I could go on. I mean, I, my, my male grads, I, there's it's some very interesting things. But one thing we do try to do, to, you know, that, to, all joking aside, is if we know from a previous interview that a, a person has had an experience with domestic violence, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, a woman who's, who's, who's discussed having, you know, an um, experience with, with, with a male offender, uh, we don't assign male interviews. The interviewers or the male interviewer is never alone. Um, so that's like the one example, I think. Because if somebody says to you, oh, you know what I mean, right? Because they recognize, or there's strange dynamics with some of, you know, we had some African-American interviewers and with MTO, and there was some class, um, ten, you know, there were, at least the interviewer was perceiving um, some class difference, even though, the, the, you know, the, the race was there. I remember, I mean, I'm just, you know, there's stories like a, um, an Hispanic father in Dallas I was interviewing was talking about, you know, um, having been involved in, uh, you know, he's selling drugs. It's not actually as common as a lot of um, people think it is among the poor. But, um, you know, he was just describing a stint for a while where he was in trouble. And for whatever reason, he turned to me and after describing, you know, using the cocaine and all sorts of stuff, and he says, you know what I mean. <laughs> and the grad student um, who was with me uh, is a quiet or you know demeanor person. Um, you know, didn't didn't ask her. Do you know what I mean? I don't know, right? So she's watching, and I, why did he ask me? I don't know. But then your instinct might be like, yeah, yeah, totally. But I said, I, I want to hear it from you, right? I don't. Anyway, so that relate is a hike ago. I get there's so many w things, right, where you have to sort of go. How do you handle that situation? Being like alike isn't always the best because you really want somebody to teach you in the least like interfering in the way, which is hard to do when you're actually with somebody in their space for a long time. So it's like an overlap of people who listen. Right, so um, there are some sociologists who think that when we interview people and we don't like move to the neighborhood for several years, that like we don't really know what's going on. Um, so there's like a subset of folks who think, right, counting things or fixating on sample, you know, is you know, not as important as is exposure time. Um, so there are subsets of, you know, I think my, my field where, you know, some of the things I do, you know, they, they don't, they're not into. Um, and then, you know, they're, so they're, and they're economists who, 
think, right, I mean, whatever, you, you guys know. So, so th that this is not, not enough people, it's whatever it is, it's messy, and, and it's because, right, you always misled and you get an administrative data set that somehow is cleaner than stuff you would have gotten if we quantified our interview data, like it's not, um, right? But it's different. So I, I think um, you have to do the homework. This is what I was saying to you guys earlier. <clears throat> I read a lot, I mean, I have for a long time. Greg Duncan was one of my mentors, I got lucky. Like I met an economist early on and learned the value. You know, and Greg was working in, you know, with, with folks on MTO and doing mixed methods work. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you've got folks like, like working with Larry Katz, who's been, you know, thinking about this intersection for a long time. And then you sort of go, well, what do I need to know, right, about some of the other work that would help me understand how to communicate? It's just the extra homework. It's almost like, right, if you're doing hidden qualitative work and not putting in your paper, the interdisciplinary collaborations require hidden homework that doesn't go in any paper. Um, you know, and, and trying to really, um, dig into, right, what is behavioral economics? Like, what is the difference between that and like other, you know, what, you know, like trying to understand um, Bellman equation or something like that. Like, I've done that. And then there's a point at which it's not my comparative advantage. The same way that some of my economic, like, economist collaborators, right, it wouldn't be the, it, the best thing for them to run a team on site because you can't do everything and keep up and be sharp and be, you know, so I think that's what the collaboration piece is the real key here instead of, and, and people will, will say, you know, I get economists writing to me saying, you know, I wanna do this or I wanna do qualitative this or that. And I think there's a, a balance between doing a little bit of it yourself so you understand like the challenges and like, but having somebody who's really good at it do it with you um, as opposed to like a bunch of stabs at things that people aren't good at. Um, but at the same time, but the little qualitative work can be really informative, but what does it do? That's what I was pushing. Um, I, you know, I didn't get as far as to get people's names yet, but pushing you to say where you were like, I just know, like we'd have to be there. Why? What is it that that? What's valuable about even two visits or one visit at a, pay, a payday lender that makes you realize like some of your assumptions are just wrong, or whatever, right? Formalizing why it is that it's important is, is key, I think, in some way, and then that's another way to communicate because then it's a scientific idea, not an econ or social idea. Yeah, it depends uh, on the study. And so we've done, um, you know, I sort of think about it kind of like a fixed effects qualitative work sometimes, right? Where we'll interview like an older sibling. And we've done a couple different things where we're trying to understand, it depends on the question we're trying to ask, right? If we've got a household head who's making a decision and who's the leaseholder who's going to get the voucher, um, you know, okay, that's a key, you know, key person. But we'll learn sometimes, right, the decision maker's really her partner. So we'll do an interview with their partner. You know, um, we'll do a subset of, of families. We did this for our book of, you know, some of the highest achieving young people from Baltimore and some of the, the, the um, young people who struggled and ended up, um, you know, in the street and spent more time with them and spent time in their worlds. Um, you know, so it, it, because we were sort of trying to get at what we might be missing. So, so for example, one thing we definitely won't do very well is understand um, you know, relationships, because you're, you know, you can ask about the relationship, but how they work, you know, for, so we would have a lot of uh, uh, young people in Baltimore saying, like, oh, I don't have any friends. You know, I do me. You know, family over everything is a tattoo uh, that one of the um, one of respondents had. Uh, yeah, I don't have friends. And there's a lot of, you know, Nick and I just finished a paper um, kind of talking about these social avoidance strategies, um, you know, that may not be great in the long run for developing social skills that'll help you, right, with like your human capital endeavors, but then it might help you survive in the near term because the less you get involved, the less, you know, drama, right? But then, you know, you, you might walk outside with your respondent and then somebody goes, oh, hey man, like what's up? And they start chatting. But what's that, right? I mean, but what does a friendship mean? Some people speak or visit. It's very different things. So if I wanted to understand that more deeply, I would not just do interviews, you know? But then the sort of hangout ethnographic work is complicated. Um, and that's a whole, a whole thing, right, that I think we have to contend with, where moving somewhere um, and it being really where you won't live is, say, one way to do it, or moving in knowing, right, this is your field site 
you start developing relationships with people. And then you have an inside view, and right, so there's a debate in sociology right now, because they're called talk is cheap, right? You know, there, so a couple of sociologists have taken a really strong position that interviews, um, you know, are useless, you know, for understanding behavior, right? And again, I think this is true if you sort of want to know how often someone discriminates or does something. I, asking for prevalence, I, I don't know, um, you know, something like that, but watching, okay, maybe, right, you could watch that and get more of a, um, you know, in, in situ idea of what's happening. And so the sort of removed, you know, hanging out in the back of a courtroom, right, and like watching interactions between like, you know, judges and, and um, uh, public defenders and stuff like that. Okay, right? I mean, I think that that's interesting. But the more involved stuff can be complicated. Um, and then even if you're watching and you're not asking, you, you know, you could end up, they call it the, um, you know, the, eco, uh, the ecological fallacy of, you know, or sort of, you know, having this attitude, behavior, and consistency. But you could also, you know, sort of end up with like an attitudinal fallacy where you're sort of going like, well, maybe you're inferring what people what, what motivates them and why they're doing things, um, but you're wrong. I mean, right? I mean, you're watching behavior and you're interpreting what it means when you could find out from someone in a more direct way. And then there are behaviors that you can never observe that are private, um, and you have to ask about them. I don't know. Um, I don't remember where your question was, but that was stuff I was thinking about. Um, but uh, you, did I get somewhere in there? Maybe not. OK, that's fine. <laughs> Is this why we you know, have to wait for the wine? But um, I think there's a, a good question in there. I saw someone behind you maybe had a or, Okay, go ahead. It dep I think it depends. I mean, I think you could end up with better survey questions when you do interviews, right? So I think that's maybe some of the little, like the cognitive interviewing that y you can do. Um, you know, I mean, like when we were looking at these, you know, wh wh why people were moving, because I was really trying to understand that as it interacted with the original MTO experiment, like what was going on there, um, you know, in, in, in asking people, like, you know, you know, right, like tell me how you decided on this house or something, right? And then having people talk about they got, ki you know, bumped out. They actually, like, right, like, didn't go and pick this place like deliberately over a period of a long time. They kind of had to leave the other one for whatever set of reasons. You can then, when you're asking questions about why people move in surveys, start with a question, right, about, you know, let's, if we talk about your last move, like, you know, was this last move, you know, um, you know, deliberate or, you know, involuntary, involuntary, or something like that, right? And then go to another. I mean, there are things like that you can do from the interview data. I don't know. I mean, I think you can ask about mechanisms, uh, you know, I think part of the point of doing qualitative work is to generate hypotheses, and there may be other ways to test them or collect data on them. Um, you know, so some of what we did in that paper that I did with Nick, Papa George, and Seth Gershenson and, and my students is, you know, looked at the NLSY data and the, um, you know, ELS data and to try to see if some of these, you know, the anticipation of shocks or beliefs about shocks um, in nationally representative data seemed related to some of the things we care about um, instead of just using the, the qualitative data for Baltimore, which wasn't collected to do that. Which has value because if you you know find something you didn't you didn't ask about right there's sort of a value in that where nobody you weren't asking people questions where they thought they had to ask tell you an answer, and then you you know you knew your answer before you were asking the questions and people can feel that, but the but the downside of that is you didn't plan design the study to answer that, um, so you know we were you know using other data sets and so I think then you could um, right collect better data for these you know probability of success and completion parameters. And so I, I'm not sure that it's better to have to do it qualitatively, but you can get the idea that way. Um, and then, you know, ask in surveys about, you know, you know do, how likely is it that you think you'll finish a four-year degree program? And that will give you your alpha, alpha right? <clears throat> I don't know if that, if that helps. I, mean, I just think about it a lot of different ways. I don't have just, I don't think there's any one way. And I think that, you know, adding qualitative work is not something people should always do because you've got limited time and money. And then if you're going to do it badly, right, and that, then don't do, you know, but there's, there's that slippery slope where if you're sort of trying to rule out obvious things with your little qualitative work, then that's actually still valuable. So it just depends. Um, there was another hand up. I see. OK. Well, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much.